Okay, why y'all will find in Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 9. There have been in situations where you knew you used to get something you couldn't remember what it was you used to get. This morning I forgot about the perfect attendance we got going here. One more week. Those of you that's made it, you got one more week, Miss Judy. You better not get sick. You better not get sick. One. <laughs> oh, maybe one more, one more week, and then we're going to give the attendance pins, all right? Mighty fine. No, sick is going to come. Well, I'm going to come to class next Sunday. <laughs> That's a good plan, but no, no. <laughs> okay, I appreciate all of you being so faithful. Sometimes our, our intentions are correct and our desires are correct, but circumstances hinder us. Paul ran into circumstances, didn't he, in his ministry. So I'm going to talk to you today about Thanksgiving in Cana. You think of Cana, you think of the ultimate in life, don't you? Uh, you think of God's blessing just being poured out. Uh, like the people as they went into Cana, well, they've been in the wilderness 40 years, land flowing with milk and honey, and, and it was just a wonderful place. But even in a place like that, God wants Thanksgiving, doesn't He? So we're going to look at the Thanksgiving in Canaan. If you will, begin at verse 9 with me. Look as we read. Seven weeks thou shalt number unto thee. Begin to number the seventh week from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God with a tribute of a free will offering of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God according as the Lord thy God has blessed thee. And thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God, thy and thy sons and thy daughters and thy man servants and thy maid servants and a Levite that is within thy gate and the strangers of the fatherless and the widows that are among you in the place which the Lord thy God has chosen, chosen to place his name there. And thou shalt remember, thou was a bondsman in Egypt, and thou shalt observe and do these statutes. Thou shalt observe the feast of the tabernacles seven days after that thou hast gathered in the corn and thy wine. Thou shalt rejoice in the feast Thy and thy sons and thy daughters and thy manservants and thy maidservants and thy Levi, the strangers and the fatherless and the widows that are within. Seven days shall I keep a solemn feast unto the Lord, thy God in the place which the Lord has chosen. Because the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thine increase and in all the works of thine hands. Therefore thou shalt surely Surely rejoice. Actually, God gave Israel two thanksgivings. Now, we only have one, but God gave Israel two thanksgivings. First of all, there was the Feast of the Weeks. The Feast of the Weeks, he said, counts seven weeks, and from the time you put the sickle to the grain. This is a feast, uh, the Feast of Weeks, if you will. It was a harvest that celebrated to God the first fruit that was gathered. The first fruit carried with it certain responsibilities. The responsibility was, of course, to honor God, but the tithe of God's house was to come out of the first fruit. Now, this usually takes place in June or June or, June or July. It was the gift of God for the first fruit, but God said, I want you to have a celebration. Later on, this would be known as Pentecost. Pentecost was a special time. It was a time in later history, and Acts tells us, it was a time when God would send the Holy Spirit. The word Pentecostal means 50, so it's 50 days after the Passover, then comes the day of Pentecost, and that's when God sent, I guess when God sent the Holy Spirit. Now, those of us who are raised on the farm can appreciate this early 
celebration. <coughs> y'all, excuse me. Lay by time. Those of you raised on farm, y'all know about lay by time, don't you? That's a wonderful, wonderful time. We got to sleep to five o'clock in the morning. We got to stay up to seven o'clock at night. I mean, we were really, really just enjoying life. Got to sit on the front porch, pick a guitar. Three things every sharecropper son had to do. Had to learn three chords on the guitar and learn to play the wild wood fly. If you couldn't do that, you just out of luck. Neighbors were complaining, dogs were howling, but the guitar had to be picked. And my dad had this uh, had this thing every other day. We cut winter wood. We didn't have that nice chainsaw you guys got. We had a cross cut cross cut saw, but then came Sunday. All oh, Sunday was a day of rest. More guitar picking. And you could stay up and get up at five o'clock. And you could stay up to seven o'clock. Times were wonderful. How you guys long for those days, don't you? Long for those days. There is in that celebration no boundaries. This little group didn't praise God and this little group couldn't. God said, I want everybody. I want even the Levites that's in your camp. I want them to celebrate. I want the fatherless. I want those that are uh, those that are maybe on the bottom of the social scale. I want everybody to praise to praise me. You know, even heathens ought to thank God for their goodness. You just stop and think how good God has been to people. In Acts chapter 2, verse 9 to 11, on the day of Pentecost in the New Testament, the Bible says that there were people there from all over, from all over the world. All over the world. And that, that is a specific day that God sent the Holy Spirit. It's an exact day that Simon Peter preached that great sermon on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 souls was converted to the Lord. But then there was another celebration he talks about between verse 15, 13 and 15. It's called the Feast of the Tabernacles. It is also called the Feast of the Endeavor. It was a celebration that took place when all crops had been gathered in. When the wine had the grapes had been uh, had been uh, trumped out in the wine press, the wine was ready, and so it was in September or October. He would celebrate this way. The people from everywhere. This was the biggest festival or Thanksgiving time of the year. Why did God not send the, the Holy Spirit here? Because the purpose of this was for these people to build those shelters and live in those shelters for a week to commemorate what hard times their forefathers had as they come through the wilderness. So they would have been scattered everywhere in those booths. So God sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost so that it was an in-gathering of, of the people. And this was, a, this, was a, this was a special time for those people. Because you see, it was also not only a time of remembrance for those that were older, but it was also a time of teaching. It was a teaching tool for the children. Because those children, 12 years old and up, they would be in those booths. And they'd ask their parents, why are we here, Mom? Why are you here, Pop? And then they'd tell them the story of the Exodus, how they were once in slavery, how God delivered them, how they lived in these booths as they traveled across the wilderness. Sometimes we need to look back. And as a faith Baptist, we had a Bush Harbor. Anybody ever been to a Bush Harbor meeting? Oh, I, I see one here, Brother Theo, he's been to one. What we, here's what a Bush Harbor is. You take four posts and put them up, about 12 foot posts. You take chicken wire, some wire, and put across it, pile of brush on the top of it. That's the way people in old days, that's how they would meet together. They'd sit under that to keep the sun off of them or the dew off of them. And so we did that one week. Brother Sam Wallace came down from Ohio and preached. And man, we just had a wonderful, wonderful revival. A lot of people got, a lot of people got saved, but it's kind of humorous. It was out in front of the church. You could hear the air conditioners running in the church. The young children was out, was in the church, so the women was fed. We furnished uh, with the help of Von Gas. We furnished everybody a fan. Those women out there beating that fan to death, and one of them said, "This is ridiculous." <laughs> 
But sometimes we need to look back, don't we? We just need to look back and remember where we have come from. A joyful feast, the most joyful feast the Bible talks about. Now in chapter 7 of the book of Matthew, the Bible says that on that last day of this feast, Jesus attended that last day, the great day of the feast, after those seven days of living in those blues has ended. And here's what, the, here's what the, the Bible says. And on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow living water. Why did Jesus say that at this particular time? Let me read what the commentary says. Shortly after dawn each morning, while the many sacrifices were being prepared, the high priest was accompanied by a joyous procession of music and worshipers coming down to the pool of Siloam. The high priest carried a golden pitcher capable of holding a little more than a quart of water. He carefully dipped the pitcher into the pool and brought it back to the temple mount. On his way back, he reached the south gate of the temple known as the water gate. As he entered, three blasts of the silver trumpets sounded from the temple. And the priest with one voice repeated the words of Isaiah, Wherefore with joy you are drawn from the well of salvation. Right as quick as that ended, Jesus said, If anyone thirsts, let him come unto me and drink, and out of his heart shall flow living water. Isn't it wonderful how Jesus made that application? What great thanksgiving experiences the nation of Israel had. But then thanksgiving came to a miracle. This was God's country. This is God's country. It is God's country. We're in a battle now. We're in a battle to keep it God's country. But it will always be God's country. We know that it started in 1623 when the governor of Plymouth Colony, William Bradford, said this. Made to, he made this proclamation. All ye pilgrims, he said, with your wives and little ones do gather at the meeting house on the hill. And there to listen to the pastor render the thanksgiving to Almighty God for all his blessings. Now this uh, pastor preached two and a half hours. That was the standard time for preaching back then. Now it's November. It's up north in those northern countries. But there they are. After that they had a great feast. The Thanksgiving feast. Uh, history tells us there were Indians there. There were, the, there were those that, <coughs> that can't come over. And there were people already over here, of course, when the pilgrims got here. They all feasted together. As time went on, the third Thursday of November became the official Thanksgiving day. And we celebrated, don't we? But I love Thanksgiving. I love the meal the other night. We had Thanksgiving. Then we got an hour on Christmas. Well, wait. There's Black Friday. And then I come broke Saturday. But we're still looking forward to Christmas time. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. But you know the greatest... Think with me now just a minute. The Thanksgiving we celebrate on a certain day and the Thanksgiving the Jewish nation still celebrates, those two celebrations, all has to do with the earth. All has to do with what Mother Earth can provide for us. But listen, Christian people, we got better than that. See, we got better than that because the greatest blessings God can give you is direct from heaven. Amen. Heavenly blessings, spiritual, spiritual <coughs> blessings. And that's basically what I want to talk to you about. First of all, so I, I want to list for you six blessings, spiritual blessings God gives us. First of all, God has given us a Father who loves us. First of all, there's God the Father who loves us. He, lives, he loves us undeservingly. I don't deserve God to love me. I could never do enough that I would deserve God to love me, but God loves me anyway. I could never do enough for Yvonne to deserve her love, but God put a love in her heart. 
Like He put a love in the heart of those of you here. God put a love in your heart for your mate, for your spouse. But then God's love is unconditional. Now I could do some things that she might stop loving me. If I could do some things and all of you would stop loving me, I know you would. But not that way with God. God's love is totally and absolutely unconditionally. Not only that, it's unmovable. And Paul said, what shall separate me from the love of God? And he lists all the things. <coughs> things present. Things in the future. But the world is missing the point of God's love. How many folks today are living in absolute misery? God loves them and they don't know that God loves them. They cannot believe anybody would love us. But listen, not only God the Father who loves us, but God the Son who lowered Himself for us. Who lowered Himself. He left the portals of glory voluntarily. God didn't toss Him out like He did Satan. He left voluntarily, came to this earth, born of a virgin, died on the cross for our sins, and was resurrected for our assurance. He walked on this earth as a prophet. Remember what the woman at the well said, Come, let me show you a prophet that told me all things. He died on the cross as my propitiation, that is, my substitute. It should have been me dying on that cross with them. I'm the one that sinned, not Jesus. But He died as my substitute. When He died on the cross, God counted it all to my, to my account when I came into knowledge of Jesus Christ. His blood paid the price for my sin upon that cross. His resurrection provided it to me a knowledge of His deity. He is our great high priest. I pray directly to God through Jesus Christ. He has promised to return to redeem this body while it lies in the cemetery of Old Town Creek, decayed away. God will raise it up. God will make it new. Whether I'm here on this earth, God will change me in the blink of an eye and take me. So there is God the Father that loves us. God the Son that Lord Himself for us. God the Holy Spirit who, love, who lives within us. First thing he did when he got here, he persuaded. How did I get saved? I didn't get here, didn't get saved just because Bill Pullen was preaching. Bill might have opened my eyes, but God had to open my heart. Open my heart through the persuasion power of the Holy Spirit of God. He is our promise. Jesus said, it's expedient that I go away. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He'll be with you forever. What's the advantage of that? The Holy Spirit can be everything everywhere at one time. He can live in every heart. If there was 10 billion more people on this planet, He can live in the heart of every one of us at one time. Not only that, He is our power to witness, to continue, to be faithful. There's something about this old flesh and blood that wears out. Things get bored and dull and, and repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly something happens. But listen, the Holy Spirit has the power to renew your mind and your heart. He is our protector. He is our protector. That is, He protects us from sin. The Bible says, live by the Spirit, not the gratification of the flesh. The Spirit gives me the ability to divide right and wrong, to divide what's correct and what is incorrect. So let's go back over now. <coughs> we got God the Father that loves us. We've got to be thankful for that. God the Son who Lord Himself for us. God the Holy Spirit who lives within us. But God ain't through yet. There is the Word of God that leads us. Amen. That leads us. It's amazing to me. I, I thought about that this week. How, how much trouble people go to to get an education and how costly it is now. It's always been a lot of trouble. When I went to school, it's a lot of trouble. When you guys went to school, it's a lot of trouble. Why do we do that? We want a better life. We want a better job. We want more knowledge. But listen to me now. This book right here offers us more than any, anything we could ever study. Amen. If I know the Bible, if I study the Bible and read the Bible, listen, it overshadows me 
Well, the knowledge of God. I have all the education in the world be an idiot. You know, that's not where wisdom comes from. Wisdom comes from the Word of God. So the Word of God that leads us. The Bible says in Psalms, it is a lamp under my feet. Y'all ever go outside in a dark stumble <laughs> and maybe fall down? If you got a cat, he's going to trip you. Fall down, then you get a flashlight. There you go. You can see the Word of God is that way in a person's life. It guides us and directs us. The Word of God is pure. The Bible says it is un unadulterated. The opinions offered in the Bible you can make your life on. It's not the opinions of man. It is the Word of God. His Word performs. That is, it does what it says it will do. It will equip the saints. <clears throat> It will equip the saints. Like I said about school, you went to school to get equipped, didn't you? Well, the, the Bible equips you for life. It exalts Christ. You cannot read the Bible without having a total different feeling about God, about Christ. It examines our heart. Am I what God wants me to be or not? Not only that, His Word, His Word is precious. Let me read to you from 1 Samuel. Hear what He said. And the Word of God was precious in those days. Talking about that when Eli was priest and Samuel was a boy. And there was no open vision. That's an instant. No open vision. There was no prophet of God. No prophet of God was saying, God revealed this to me in a dream. God told me this. Folks, that's exactly where we're at now. That's why the Word of God should be a precious thing to us. We don't have a prophet of God doing miracles and doing things and we can listen to it, but we have the Word of God. Amen. That's why He gave it to us. It was precious. The Word of God, the Bible says, is way that we, the way that we prosper. Let me read this. Blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of... Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the way in the way of sinners, nor sinneth in the seat of the uh, scornful, but is delighted in the laws of the Lord, and the law does he meditate day and night. He likes like a tree planted by the water, bringing forth his fruit in season, and his leaves shall not wither and blow away. His word, the Bible says, will never pierce. Jesus said, heaven and earth may pass away. But my word will never pass away. But there's something else. Not only the word of God that leads us, but the trials that learn us. Why does God send trials into our life? Why? Why, is, why must there be sins? Why must there be death? Why must there be failures? I have a problem. Why must that happen? Well, you know, certainly. God does never initiate anything like that. Never does. But God lays hold on them through the Holy Spirit. And in those trials and tribulations and time of laying awake at night and worrying and praying, God is building in us patience. Patience. Patience that exceeds all human understanding. But that, not only that, trials lead to spiritual maturity. The Bible calls it perfection. But too many times we want to connect the word perfection with sinlessness. Folks, we'll never be sinlessness, but we can be mature Christians. It will lead us to preparedness. That is wisdom. When we practice wisdom, it will lead us to being prepared for life. But there's one more thing. One more thing. One more spiritual gift God's given you. God has given you a church that lifts you up. Amen. Amen. And those of you that are listening to me on social media, let me say to you, if you're in a church that don't love you, you get out. You get out now. Thank God for this little fellowship that we have here. Folks, I don't think we realize what we got here. The church is a brotherhood. It's a brotherhood of people who respect each other. Who respect each other. I may not agree with all your opinions, but I've got to respect you because you're a Christian. 
If the church is a body, what does that mean? That means, that means if Theo's hurt now, that means if Benny's hurt, I'm hurt. That means if Carolyn's grieved, I'm Because we're all part of the body of Christ. The church is a building. Jesus Christ is the foundation. And on this foundation, I'm building one or two things. I'm building wood, hay, or stubble. Or I'm building gold, precious stone, silver. I'm building on that. God's going to try me as if by fire and judgment. Here yeah, my foundation goes through wood, hay, and stubble. It's gone. I have no rewards. Gold, silver, precious stone. Remain. Remain. The church is the bride of Jesus Christ. The bride of Jesus Christ. Happiest people in the world is a bride and groom. Man, I'm telling you, it amazes me. Here she is all God alive. That may be the ugliest man in the world. He's so ugly he turned a freight train down a lot more. But she got to her, man, her eye. She's all Ladies, y'all been there, don't you? <laughs> Not you had an ugly, ugly husband. Now, <laughs> I better, I better get dig out of that trunk, place. And the husband, here he is, man. He he is just all thoughts about her, all intention. You know what? They they're dreaming of a great life together. Amen. Since you got saved, you and Jesus had a great life together. Amen. I've been some rock roads. I've been some up and down. I've been some hard times. But through it all, through it all, God's loved you and God's brought you through through your life, you see. This morning we're going to sing an invitation. Now, I don't know who, knows who needs to do what, but I'm going to give you an opportunity. If the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and you know there's a decision you need to make, you need to make it publicly. You need to make it so you won't forget it next Sunday. You see, the thing about making decisions behind the pew is the devil will steal it from you before you get out of the church if you're not careful. So as we sing this morning, if you'd like to come and make a decision for Jesus, let's stand together as a human sinner.